All right, ladies and gentlemen, in order to be successful for today's instruction, you need your focus out, notebook, whiteboard. Let's go. Focus, notebook, whiteboard. Friendly reminder, you have a test tomorrow, 25 questions, all multiple choice. All of your weekly tests will always be multiple choice. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am not going to talk over you in order to complete content. Hell no. First of all, I don't get paid that much. I'm not going to work harder than I have to, okay? Here we go. Uh, let's look at your focus. Take it out. I want you to open to the very last page, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you will notice that there is a chart, yes? That's what we are discussing. Now, starting in, let's take a gander so we can speak with specifics. Oh, how fun. In three weeks, we have our first writing week, and week six. Week six, we are doing essays for the whole week. There is no new content. All you do is write essays. That's what we do. It is terrible. You're going to hate it. It's going to be so much fun. And by fun, I mean no. However, three quarters of your essay score comes from, uh, three quarters of your test score come from the? Essay. So you got to write them. So we got to figure it out. I got to teach you. We're going to use our content. It's fantastic. With that being said, how? we talk about essays is through the lens of social, political, interactions, innovations, and culture. I don't know if I said that one. Whatever. So it's called um, pieces. That's what it's abbreviation. So they'll say in the time period from 1200 to 1450 in the region of East Africa, what are two major innovations? So you have to know, okay, what are the innovations during this time period? What people are there? What happening? Stuff like that. Now we're going to practice these skills, but this is really your first time coming across. So this isn't Ms. Bennett just being arbitrary for no reason. This is working on your essay development. It's fun. Are you talking during writing week and week six? Yeah. Yes. You can use your resources, but you will see. Don't stress about writing week until we're in writing week, and then you can stress about it. Is that fair? You signed up for this class, by the way. You could be living your dream life in honors. What do you got? This is like a lot of homework. No. It's homework and schoolwork. Yeah, you have a lot of homework of essays. And then in class, all we do is talk about essays. Guys, don't wait, worry about it because we're not there. We still have two more weeks of regular stuff. And then you'll see what writing week looks like. I don't know, dude. Look at your scope and sequence. It's not arbitrary. It's not just random. It's on there. Okay. Yeah, look at it. Guys, I, I'm a planner. I don't know if you notice. I plan things. It's not arbitrary. We follow the schedule. Lauren. Is there going to be a focus during that week? No, because it's writing week, and all we do is? Writing. Yes. Can we not worry about writing week? <laughs> that was not the point of today's instruction. Addison, what? No. No, because on May 11th, you have to handwrite it. So no, you have to practice. We've got to build up those wrist strengths. Why is that an ew? Are you OK? Why am I recording this? This is awful. <laughs> Moving forward. Your essay formats come in these types of stems, as in what are the political changes that are happening in East Asia during the period of 1200 to 1450. So in order to practice that, we do charts when we get to the reviews. I am not looking for tons and tons of information, though I do see some bossness over here from Raina. Um, I'm looking for just one answer for each box, trying to keep it simple. Oh, I see you, Zoe. Look at you crushing it. So let's do the first one across together. Let's do East Asia together. So East Asia, political one. Okay, a political one is they use a centralized imperial bureaucracy. Okay, so I'm looking for a centralized imperial bureaucracy. For innovations, they are going to use Tampa Rice. Okay, from Vietnam. That's what I would put in the box. Uh, then we have environment. Creation of the Grand Canal would be a bomb answer. Okay, they're literally moving Earth 
in order to create it. Uh, culture, I would do Confucianism or feel piety or both because they're good answers. You see where I'm going here, people. Okay, then I have uh, economic. I would write proto-industrialization. It's really the only place in the world doing it at this time period. And finally, social, I would write scholar gentry, which is going to be based on civil services then. What do you got? What is the culture? Culture is going to be Confucianism and uh, file piety. So that's all I'm looking for in each of those boxes, but for each of the civilizations. Sounds good? Okay. Perfect. You can put your focus away, take out your notes. Let's do it. Cannot stress, you need me more than I need you. I'm happy if we could just mess around and not do anything. That would make my day better. You still have a test tomorrow, so it's on you, not me. All right, here we go. So yesterday was kind of a weird day for us since we sat on the floor for a little bit, yeah? yeah. So who can raise their hand and tell me cohesively where we left off? Lauren. Okay, Chandita converts to Islam to attract trade. Is he devout? No. no, he's doing it for economic reasons. Okay, so um, his grandson, Mansa Musa, will become devout. Okay, so Chandita, uh, that's good enough. We know that. Okay, so East Africa is your next heading. Okay, East Africa. It is along the Indian Ocean Basin. Okay, so East Africa, okay, it is on the Indian Ocean Basin. So it's on the Indian Ocean Basin trade route, yes? Okay, so when we're talking about it, you need to know the major civilization is the Great Zimbabwe. Okay, the Great Zimbabwe. It is large and non-Islamic, but they are pro-Islam. Why are they pro-Islam? Why do they like Muslim people, Kaden? For better trade. Yes. So their civilization is not Islamic. However, they love welcoming Muslims because Muslims bring trade and money and all these things. Keep that in mind. Uh, from the east coast of Africa, Great Zimbabwe, they are trading gold. Stoneware, pottery. Gold, stoneware, and pottery. Stoneware, which means they take stones and they carve it into like plates and vases and stuff like that. So stoneware and pottery. You need to know that it is all boat, like uh, maritime trade. It's all maritime trade. They're not really trading over land. It's maritime, okay? So they're on water. Uh, you do need to know that they do build a big wall. It's called the Great Wall of Zimbabwe. In AP Art History, you study it. It's really cool. It's a circular city. It's really, really cool. Um, they do build, that's their big accomplishment. Okay. Then you also have Ethiopia. Ethiopia is now also known as Aksum. Please know that. You can spell it with an A-K or a I. Um, you need to know it is the only Christian place in Africa by choice. Everywhere else it becomes Christian is by? Ooh. There you go. They pick it up. A random Christian was trading. So how common is that? Not common. A random Christian was trading and went to Aksum and the, he was talking about like Jesus and stuff. And they're like, oh my God, that sounds so cool. Jesus, let's be Christians. And the whole civilization converts to? Christianity. Which is very weird because there's practically no Christians outside of Europe and a little bit in the Holy Land, yes? So it's very strange. So you need to know Kingdom of Axum is like the only place outside of Europe that chooses Christianity. You need to know. That Kingdom of Aksum is also slight, uh, lightly, lightly in Trans-Saharan trade, because they're so far north. They're lightly in Trans-Saharan trade as well. So they're in both the Indi they're definitely in the Indian Ocean Basin, but they lightly trade with Trans-Saharan because they're so far north. Cool. 
Perfect. You are officially caught up. This is where your period started today. You're feeling pretty good? I worked really hard yesterday. So did you, but I'm more important. Here we go. Your next heading is Europe. Okay. A couple things you need to know about Europe. Europe has a large population. Write it down. Europe has a large population. Why? Why? Addison. They have a lot of food. And what's the major grain? What's the major food item, Addison? What's the specific one? Wheat. Okay. Wheat is one of the most nutrient dense foods you can have. Europe has tons of it, so it does have a large population. You need to know that Rome is going to fall in 1492. Your, uh, Roman Empire falls in 1492. Okay? So we are picking up after the fall. Now, I need you to write Middle Ages. Okay? Huh? No, it's not. It's, it's under Europe. It's fine. Oh. We're in the Middle Ages. It is from 1492 to the Renaissance. Renaissance is about late 1450s, 1500s. Yes? Middle Ages, usually. We don't we typically, we definitely don't use Dark Ages because that is a connotation that Europe is the light of the world. And that's a little, yeah, a little pretentious. Oh, I like that. I was going to say racist, but yes. Pretentious is a better way to say that. So yes, a little pretentious. So we don't use Dark Ages anymore. Um, but yeah, so Renaissance means rebirth, okay? So the Middle Ages goes from 1492, the fall of Rome, to the Renaissance, which is like the rebirth of art and culture in the West. Mm. Lauren? Can you repeat the year the Renaissance? The Renaissance is like 1450s, 1500s. So it officially starts in the south of Italy in 1450s, but it reaches the high of Germany by 1500s. There you go. When we're talking about, this is so helpful, thank you. So, when we're talking about the Middle Ages, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about feudalism, and that is where we will pick up today. Okay, so feudalism is going to be the common government structure in Europe. It is caused because of who? Vikings. The Vikings are coming around killing people. It is also caused by what other smaller group less impactful did? The Muslims. Keep in mind, the Muslims really aren't raiding that much into Europe because there's nothing of value really in Europe. Okay, there's not much going on. There's not much trade. There's not much wealth right now. It's just kind of bland. Okay, don't worry. If you're sad about the white people not having a lot going on, it's going to change, <coughs> and Europeans are going to rise and take over the rest of the world. This is perfectly fine, but they're kind of blah. And by kind of blah, they're really blah. Okay, because like there's nothing happening now. Vikings, Muslims are attacking, people are scared, so that's where feudalism comes in, okay? Europe is not really trading, you need to know that. There's not a ton of trade happening in Europe because they don't really have any items because they're afraid for their lives. The second thing, they don't really have any technological growth because everyone is afraid for their lives. There you go. So, not a great time to be in Europe. Actually, I wouldn't want to be in Europe at all during this time especially if you're a woman, <laughs> if you're anything other than a white male, then still not a great time to be in Europe for a white male. Here we go. On my board, just to make it easier for you so I can cover lots of content for you. Isn't that nice? Now, my first row of people, if you want to take a picture to make it easier for you to see, mostly Thomas, because he's like on the worst spot in the house. If you want to take a picture of my board, that's perfectly fine and perfectly reasonable. So, feudalism, you need to know it is based on rights and obligations. This is new content, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so feudalism is based on rights and obligations. You have the right to protection, but you have the obligation to farm. So when we're talking about feudalism, we're talking about rights and obligations. Every single person has a right and an obligation, even the king. The king has the right to collect taxes, but the obligation to protect everyone in his kingdom. So keep that in mind. So when you're talking about feudalism, you have to be able to say your right is this and obligation is that. Okay, you need to know it is decentralized. So there is a king, but if the king is a decentralized king, are they really that powerful? 
Yeah, there's just some weird guy who collects our taxes far, far away. Okay, so decentralized, there is a king, but they're weak, and they appoint lords to manage the territory. What do you got? Can we just do like every single I'm sorry, so I'm, for some reason, I, what? Are they even just like restricting their lords? Yeah, of course. Yeah, because they don't want the lords to become too powerful and overthrow the king and stuff like that. Which, of course, happens all the time, which is why we have a thousand movies about it, yeah? Okay, so... Someone asked me to give them a visual, so I gave them a visual. You do not have to draw my visual, but let me explain it. So, here is a piece of land. The whole thing is run by a king, and that's why it's called a? Look at you. You put it together. Perfect. Now, the king lives in the castle. Yes, that's a castle. Someone said that's not a castle. I thought that was rude. This is my castle, and that's where the king lives. Well, the king wants to sit around, drink, and eat delicious food and count his money, he doesn't want to actually do any of the work. So he sits in the castle and divides up his land amongst his four closest friends called lords. This is the original king, of course. This will be descendants. You do not have to draw it. Just listen. So the lords take over the four territories. They are the ones who are in charge to make sure that the king gets their taxes every single year. That's their major responsibility to the king. Now, in each corner, the lord is in charge of this whole territory. But in order to make sure the people there are protected, they have to have knights. They have to pay them, and they don't really have money, so he's going to give them pieces of land. So this is why knights have little pieces of land. Okay? The knights are loyal to the lord. The Lord is loyal to the king. Who does everyone see on a regular basis? The king or the Lord? Lord. So who is the most influential person in their lives? Lord. There you go. You really don't see the king ever, 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 ever in your life. You just kind of hear about rumors. <laughs> okay? So that is how it's divided up. Let's talk about the social class, and we'll come back to our little diagram here. So at the top, of our social structure, we have the lords. Why isn't it the king? Because like you never see the king, and the king's just like this fragment of your imagination that lives far off, and it's kind of scary. Okay, so your lord has the right to own and manage the land. Okay, the lord has that right. They get all this land, they get to do with it whatever they want. But they have the obligation to serve the king and collect the taxes. So they have to do the heavy lifting of getting the taxes done. Okay, underneath lords, you have knights. Okay, Sophie, you should be writing this down and not relying on the photos of which you've taken of my hard work that I put on the board, yeah? Cool. So knights are your second tier, ladies and gentlemen. They have the right to own a land, which is called a fief. Okay, given by the lord. So... In order to buy their loyalty, they get land, which they can make money off of. Land is the most valuable thing in Europe. If you own land, you can improve the quality of your future generation. Same thing today. Imagine if you bought a house in South Tampa 15 years ago. How much value does that house have today? Some, it's over 50, 60%, or double at least, sometimes triple the original price. Okay, so owning land is the fastest way to grow generational wealth. That's why they give land. Obligation is to fight for the Lord. They have to sacrifice their life for the life of the Lord. Now, in the early stages of feudalism, you think there's a lot of fighting? Yeah, yeah. yeah. because they're like Vikings are like straight up doing Viking things. At the end of feudalism, how much fighting do you think there is? Yes. Not. There's not much. Do you know how feudalism ends? The Black Plague. Okay, not some big war or something. So they all the knights get big and fat and lazy. All right. Peasants are third tier. Peasants are free people who can leave. They have no rights and no obligation because they're not a part of feudalism, but they exist. So that's why we have them up here. They are not a part of feudalism because they don't sign a feudal contract. They're peasants. They don't actually belong in feudalism, but they actually do exist. They exist, but there's not many of them. There's very, very few. Okay, then at the bottom, we have serfs. S-E-R-F-S, -S, not like the wave. Okay, serfs. 
are not slaves. Because if they were slaves, we would call them Look at you. You figured it out. They're called serfs because they're not slaves. They are in a coerced labor system. They are forced to do labor. And especially as feudalism continues beyond their own will. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. Okay? They have the right to protection. They have the right to protection from the, pez uh, from the knights and the lords against the Viking and the Muslims. However, they have the obligation to farm. They have the obligation to farm. That is their job. Now, in order to become a serf, you have to sign a feudal contract. That is how you become a serf. Now, you need to know these are inherited by birth. So if your great-grandfather 15 generations ago signed a feudal contract, you as their descendant are a? Coerced. This is how it becomes a coerced. So the first generation of serfs, are they coerced? Yeah. yeah, it's a choice. Jasmine, I don't need to live your yawn, dude. With that being said, this is going to continue for about 900 years. By the end, or even 200 years in, is it becoming coerced? Yeah. Yes. What do you got, son? So, can you move a profession? No, no. Dude, you are born the peasant or the serf or the knight you are, and that is it. Now, every once in a while, you hear these wonderful stories of a serf who rose up and was, like, amazing, and they made him a knight because he's such a hero. But, like, how often do you think that happens, your son? Right? No. If you were born a serf, you die a serf. There's no hope for your 15th generation grandchildren because they're going to also die a serf. What do you got, Olivia? Yeah, they can sign, they can sign a document. But if you've escaped it for so long, because when we're talking about peasants, we're like 300, 500, 600 years into this process because it's a 900 year long system. Um, you're not going to dip in. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, they do it in a big picture kind of thing. Like, what was the plan? Mostly the kings are just doing crusades at this point. Okay. They're going to the Holy Land to kill Muslims. Okay. Uh, and getting their butts handed to them, by the way. The kings are literally getting their butts handed to them because if you had to bet on a group of people, would you bet on the Christians or the Muslims? Muslims. Yeah, they are far more superior in technology and skills and all that stuff. And the Europeans show up and they're just, like, dirty. And they're just, ugh. Because they haven't evolved, really. Alex. Um, now, of course, is that going to change? Yes, of course. This is unrelated, but do you think in such a situation there is a little difference with between these decentralized serf and centralized? Sure. Decentralized means it's kind of there's no really one person in charge. It's smaller groups of people. The smaller groups of people would be the four lords are really in charge of all the land. Right? Yeah. This is a great question. Thank you for asking, because I assume you guys knew. When we talk about decentralized, it means there's no one clear leader. Okay. That it is a bunch of smaller leaders leading smaller sections that have some sort of togetherness. Yeah. Okay? That's a decentralized government. A centralized government, a perfect one would be in China, the Song Dynasty. Who is the leader? The emperor. The emperor is the definitive thing that everyone knows exactly who it is. Everyone feels like they have some sort of connection to, and the emperor is in charge of every single aspect of society. That is a centralized ruler. Aztec. The emperor is a demigod. It's a theocracy, but it's a centralized theocracy. Everyone knows the emperor is in charge. They can literally point and say, that's the emperor. This is how it works. This is how it's done much more effective for a government. If you were going to be a king, you'd want to be in a centralized government. Okay? What do you got? Um, yeah. Black Plague. Kills one third of Europe. <laughs> That's how you get out. What do you got? Oh, you mean like if you're in it? Yeah. No. You die. Yeah, and then your poor kids are stuck in it. Andrew. Do the lords revolt? Yeah, of course. Because the kings are kind of like lazy, and they don't really do much, and they're the ones handing the money. So they're like, screw you, king, and that's how we have like overthrows and stuff. Yeah, have you seen any like movies about the Middle Ages? They're all killing each other. What do you got? Sure. Okay, so feudalism is a social and political system. Okay? 
The economic system of feudalism is called manoralism. Okay? Manoralism is based on the manor house. See, manor, manor, yeah? That's why. It becomes the economic center of feudalism. So, where is the economic center of every feudal village? The manor. There are four manors on this little diagram. So, is it a centralized economy or decentralized economy? Is that how you make a lot of money or very little money? Very little, okay? So every serf must produce a specific amount of grain because that's their obligation. They have the right to protection but the obligation of farm. So what they do is they have to farm a certain amount, maybe like a bushel of grain. And don't ask me what a bushel is, I don't know, okay? But a bushel of grain for the uh, Lord. Anything over a bushel has to feed their family and anything over that then they can sell for surplus. How much surplus do you really think these people are doing? If they only owe the Lord a bushel and they need two bushels to feed their family, do you think they're going to grow 12 bushels worth of hay or uh, wheat? No, because they're not really getting anything out of it. There's really no money to get. So people are just like, blah. There's nothing... They're not really motivated, they have no need, they have the protection, and a lot of historical records just talk about how Europeans were drunk all the time. Think about it. The rest of the world has figured out if you boil water, you can drink water. Europeans have not discovered this technology yet, so the only things they're drinking is what? Beer and wine. So they wake up, they start drinking. How productive do you think that makes you? Yeah, not productive. So that is a huge criticism of the Europeans from like the Muslims who are drinking tea, who have uh, used clear minds, and mostly it gets banned during this time, alcohol for a lot of Islamic states. So because they've advanced beyond it, Europe is going to be drinking heavily <laughs> until really like the 1700s. It's not until the invention of tea that comes back from the Americas that they stop drinking as heavily. Uh, not tea. Uh, it's really the 1400s when we start declining in drinking. Just a fun fact for you. Lauren. Do they have to eat wheat directly or do they have to like, make it? Like, it's not like pop like wheat seeds. Yeah, yeah they make bread. Okay. Yeah, they grind so is it. That, like, from an mm -hmm. old drum, or is that yeah, you would have like a wheat grinder, like a grind the big stones and they would have like a and pull it around and stuff like that. In honors, you will draw a feudal chart where you would draw a little map of where everyone is and all of that. It's called a grain, granary, where they grind the grains. We don't have time for that. Here we go. Chivalry is based on Christianity and puts women on a pedestal. This is not good for women. Now, I'm telling you about chivalry that has existed from 1494 to the Renaissance. Am I talking about 2022 chivalry? Chivalry and its original envision is incredibly destructive for women because women were supposed to be dainty, silent, vigilant to Jesus, and need complete and utter protection because they're too frail to do anything. We're also put on a pedestal. And if you're on a pedestal, the only place you can go is down. It is incredibly destructive for women. It puts these completely unreal expectations and it completely destroys the women's ability to uh, progress physically, socially, economically, all of it. Socially is a huge big thing too. Now, you need to know in Europe there's very little technology happening and very little cultural events. Literally everywhere else in the world we have trade booming. How much trade in Europe? No. I mean, it's not none, but it's like super minimal. Okay, your next heading is High to Late Middle Ages, ladies and gentlemen. That's your next heading. Now, keep in mind, the Middle Ages are going to last for about 900 years. So we're talking the last, like, seven, uh, the last 200 years of it. Okay? Now, there is going to be a shift to building cities, parentheses, urbanization and increasing trade. It's a slow process. Nothing about Europe screams things are moving quickly, yes? Literally, the rest of the world is 
Like the Americas have these huge booming cities that are holding 60,000 people at a time and Europe is struggling with a population of 500 in certain villages. Okay, like, I mean, it's crazy. Feudalism, you're going to put a star, of course, ends with the Black Plague. Now, next week, we're going to talk about the spread of the Black Plague and how it collapses, but just know that it ends because of the Black Plague. You need to know that serfs become more valuable than ever, so they demand to be paid. Just like with our pandemic, workers became more valuable, right? in the pandemic so now people are making higher wages than they were before because the world realized how valuable they were with that being said um the workplace has changed same things happen with the black plague but obviously in a much more dire situation everyone pretty much dies in the black plague so the people who live are like shit i'm not doing this for free you want it you pay me is that how feudalism is built no so Feudalism cannot handle paying serfs, so it completely and utterly collapses. Is this a good thing or a bad thing for serfs? It's a good thing, because keep in mind, feudalism is based on protection. Could the serfs be protected from the plague? No. So they saw it as, well, you can't protect me. This whole contract doesn't make any sense. People are dying in crazy ways, which is a pretty good argument, if you ask me. Now, in the high to late Middle Ages, we also see the creation of a thing called a guild. A guild is similar to what we refer to as a union. It's not a union, but it's pretty similar to a union. It is where they control who can make items and at what price. Now think about it. If our little village had 200 people in it, one baker could supply and take care of us for 200 people. If we have 250 people, is it worth bringing in another baker? No, no, because it's gonna take away tons of money from the first baker. So, in order to make sure that their business is secure, they are limiting who can start certain types of crafts. So, the baker isn't going to allow a second bakery to open in the town unless the population is big enough for it. So. 200, he's not going to have, it's only one baker. 300, he's thinking about opening up another baker or allowing another baker. And at 400, he would allow another baker because they both have enough means that they would both have strong businesses. Does that make sense? It is going to build up the economic uh, strength of Europe. Now, are they going to rebuild Europe? Is it going to become an economic powerhouse? Yes, of course. Okay? Once we get through the Renaissance, uh, Rome is going. Uh, Rome, uh, Europe is going to take off. And spoiler alert: they take over the world. Meriwether. What's their form of payment? Huh? Like when they like take their things, how do they do it? They're usually doing barter. They don't really have coins or anything. And keep in mind, the Muslims are using coins. The Chinese are using paper. They're that advanced. Europeans are bartering. My son barters at his lunch table every day. He's two. Okay, well, I give him healthy snacks. He likes the junky snacks, so he barters. What am I to do? I appreciate the hustle. If you want the cupcake the kid has, rally it up. Questions, concerns, comments? Everyone good? Perfect, take it to the board. It's the end of contract, here we go. How much time do I have? Perfect, on your whiteboard. Please tell me. What are two centralized theocracies we studied this week? What are two centralized theocracies? I got one, come on now, two, three, Bronson. Perfect. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the road system the Incans built? Good. What do we got, Thomas? On your whiteboard, please tell me what civilization is known for their bloodletting or human sacrifice? Good. Alex? On your whiteboard, please tell me what continent struggles with non agrable land? Good. Luke? Africa. Africa. What continent struggles 
those with wheat nutritional grain. Zoe, America, name that grain that is weak, and it goes by two names, two names, two. Give me two names. Good. What is it, Olivia? Yeah, it doesn't. In, like, no. Like, don't shout the answers, dude. No, he can figure it out. He can see what he knows and what he doesn't know. That's the point of the board. Here we go. On your whiteboard, Andrew, stop talking. I'm over that two of you. All right, here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the name of the first kingdom in Africa? Good. What do we got? Jade. Oh, sorry. No. Caden. Ghana. On your whiteboard. What? Before kingdoms rise, what is the name of the government structures before kingdoms and the rise of Ghana? Uh, no, that's not a government structure. What is it? It's, uh, what is it? Reina, kinship or clan? On your whiteboard, please tell me. What is the cultural foundation of all of Africa? They are a kinship group. What is the cultural foundation of Africa? What do you got, Christine? Bantu. The Bantu are going to spread two things through Africa. On your board, write it down. They are the cultural foundation. What are the two things? What did John say? Language and? Not crafts. Iron. That's not crap, dude. Like, do you call blacksmiths like craftsmen? No, they're blacksmiths because they're dealing with iron. Super masculine. Yeah, right? All right. Here we go. Metallurgy or metal work or iron work and language is what the Bantu are spreading. On your whiteboard, right? One, two, three. Tell me which one, Europe, Africa, or the Americas is best for women, which is number one, or worse for women, which is three. Your choices are Africa, Europe, Americas. Which one is best for women? Third is worse for women. Write it down. You should have three things on your board, people. Which one is best is number one, worse. Turn to your neighbor, check your answers, go. Yeah. 